Welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to another program in the Conversations with Great Leaders series. And for those of you who have uh, not been here uh, before, um, I'd also like to welcome you to Roosevelt House, which is the Public Policy Institute of Hunter College and the historic home of Sarah Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. And Roosevelt House is also the Institute's home in New York City. Um, it's the place where we do many of our programs, thanks to a wonderful relationship with Jennifer Rabb and her great staff here at uh, Hunter. And I'd also like to welcome any of the Institute's uh, Society of Fellows and Vanguard members. Um, uh, as you may know, we have a whole slew of programs that we're planning for you this autumn, starting with a uh, conversation between two former congressmen about the upcoming election, but enough said about that. Um, if you uh, want to uh, find out more about Society of Fellows and Vanguard, uh, you can check the Institute's website, www.aspeninstitute.org. So on to tonight's program, um, the Conversation with Great Leaders series in memory of Preston Robert Tisch began in 2009 as a way to feature leaders who are making a difference in their communities by the way they look at their role in helping to build a civil society, in other words, a place that we all want to live. These leaders represent the values and commitment to public good that reflect the belief and work of the man honored by this series, Bob Tisch. His family, Steve Tisch, Lori Tisch, Lizzie and Jonathan Tisch, as well as Lori M. Tisch Illumination Fund, generally, generously make it possible for us to bring you programs like the one you're going to have tonight, um, where um, our, our speakers share their insights and wisdom about leadership. Now questions about leadership and what constitutes a leader, what kind of a leader we need right now are always important and perhaps never more so than at this moment. With presidential elections less than two months away and opening to be filled on the Supreme Court and with issues ranging from health care and national security to voting rights in the news, tonight's discussion seems particularly pertinent. So let me introduce tonight's speaker. Linda Greenhouse has spent 30 years covering the Supreme Court for the New York Times. Since 2009, she has been the Joseph Goldstein Lecturer in Law and Knight Distinguished Journalist in Residence at Yale Law School. She also writes a bi-weekly op-ed column on the Supreme Court and Law for the New York Times website. Linda has received numerous reporting awards, including a Pulitzer Prize. Her most recent book, which will be available for purchase and signing after the program, is The Burger Court and the Rise of the Judicial Right, co-authored with Michael Graetz. Is that right, Graetz? Yes. Okay. Um, our moderator this evening is David Greenberg, a professor of history and of journalism and media studies at Rutgers University. And David's new book, Republic of Spin, an Inside History of the American Presidency, will also be available for purchase and signing after the program. So now I'm going to turn the program over to David. Thank you, Linda. And, and thank you all for coming tonight. It's great to see uh, a full room and, and so much interest, not surprising, given uh, our guest and uh, her terrific book, which I commend to all of you. Um, one nice benefit um, of, of being up here tonight is having had the occasion to, to read it and, and think about it. And I think it raises really a lot of interesting questions, both about history, uh, and it is striking that this period that many or most of us here lived through is really is history. It, you read the book and you see how different times were. Um, and also, I think, as I hope we can get into it, speaks still to a lot of questions about the court and about law uh, today. Um, but I thought maybe I'd start by asking um, about how you chose to wrote, write the book. Uh, there are other books on the Burger Court. Um, one of my favorites is The Brethren. I was mentioning Bob Woodward before, and there have been other 
more academic books. So uh, what led you to mine this period in our legal history? So my co-author, Michael Gratz, uh, <coughs> who actually is one of the leading academic authorities on tax policy, would not seem to be a logical co-author for a book like this, but he got very interested. Of course, tax policy reflects political choices and social policy and so on, and he got very interested in various tax-related debates uh, from the 70s, and he was a neighbor of mine down the hall at Yale, um, where he's now emeritus. He teaches full-time at Columbia now. Uh, and we started talking about the Burger Court. And actually, yes, The Brethren is the book that leaps to mind, if any book leaps to mind, if The Burger Court at all leaps to mind, which it doesn't much. Right. Um, <laughs> and it came, The Brethren came out in, I think, 1979. Burger Court went on till 1986. So there was, they got a lot of good stuff, but what they didn't have was perspective. And actually, in our opinion, there's no book that reflects what we think is the proper perspective on this period. Uh, the Burger Court has been kind of written off as a transitional period in between, you know, very liberal Warren Court, much more conservative Renfis Court, and now Roberts Court, a period when, you know, nothing happened. So there's really not a lot of, there's a great interest in the 70s now, but not a lot of Supreme Court focused interest in the 70s. And so it's really a project of historical reconstruction of a period. Berger was chief justice for 17 years. It's not a book about Berger. It's not a personality-driven book. But a whole lot of things happened at the Supreme Court that define our constitutional landscape today, and I'm sure we'll be discussing them. Uh, not only uh, what happened, but what was prevented from happening. So can I mention just one yeah, I mean, as an course. example? Yeah, yeah. So, so people here probably read um, a week or so ago about the state court decision in, in Connecticut uh, striking down the school financing system in Connecticut. And you might say, well, you know, what's that doing in the state court in Connecticut? Isn't that sort of a national issue, national problem? So it was a Burger Court decision, San Antonio against Rodriguez, that cut off what had been a very potent and, and quite likely to succeed effort to make school financing a federal constitutional issue through the Equal Protection Clause. Because why should poor school districts with, with poor property wealth have to tax themselves a whole lot more than wealthy districts and so on and so on. And, and there was a whole movement uh, in the mid 70s to get this into the courts and it was succeeding. But on the eve of the case <coughs> reaching the Supreme Court, uh, the Burger Court coalesced. Nixon got his four appointments within the first three years. And the claim in, in this case from San Antonio was rejected by a vote of five to four. Uh, you know, and we've been living with the results of that uh, for, for more than a generation since. And so that's just an example of things that you know, are kind of beneath today's radar of, of the, the turn to the right, uh, and the consequences today. Right, and the turn to the right, I think, is clearly a theme of the book and one you argue uh, very persuasively. I mean, to remind people of the history, Richard Nixon had four appointments to the Supreme Court, and um, this was coming after the very liberal, very revolutionary Warren Court, which really transformed you know, constitutional law and jurisprudence on you know, any number of issues. Um, but some people have held that, you know, given the fear, given, well, Nixon and four justices, uh, well, it didn't turn out to be quite so conservative, right? And Harry Blackman starts off on the right, but he kind of drifts over to a more liberal position. And some of the others, you know, Lewis Powell, kind of end up as these more centrist figures. And so one argument is that, well, it wasn't the counter-revolution that was anticipated. It was more like a, a just a kind of moderating moment. And you could point to some very uh, liberal decisions or outcomes that we think of as liberal, Roe v. Wade and the Pentagon Papers, to say, all right, we kind of, uh, you know, if you're on the left, dodged a bullet there, that you didn't get that full counter-revolution. But you even sort of 
push back against that line of thinking somewhat, yeah, right? Yeah, so it really goes to the reason why the Burger Court has been written off as the nothing happened court. So, uh, so just to back up for a minute, so Richard Nixon ran against the Warren Court. I mean, not solely against the Warren Court, but, but it was a major theme of his presidential campaign in 1968. Uh, there was actually a lot of crime in the country. People were quite concerned about it. Uh, a lot of violence, and Nixon pointed a finger at the Warren Court and said, this is the court's fault. Uh, he kind of used crime as the, the dog whistle to use the current image for race. He couldn't quite say what he wanted to say about race, and so he turned it into crime. Um, people were quite responsive to that. So there was an expectation that the famous criminal procedure opinions of the Warren Court, Miranda, uh, the exclusionary rule case map, um, Gideon, and so on, would be overturned, and they weren't. What they were, however, was hollowed out. And so the shell or the facade is still standing of these cases, but I mean, to take the exclusionary rule, I mean, case after case gave reasons why evidence that was illegally seized or that was seized in you know, violation of the suspect's constitutional rights could be admitted anyway. I mean, just all kinds of rules, including the last term you might remember that Justice Sotomayor wrote um, a, a very powerful and widely noticed dissenting opinion in which she she invoked, uh, you know, James Baldwin and um, the new Jim Crow and Ta-Nehisi Coates and things you don't usually see cited in a Supreme Court opinion. It was a case where uh, the police officer had stopped a guy who was leaving a house that uh, was thought maybe was a drug house and um, asked for his ID and ran a warrant check and lo and behold, he had an unpaid parking ticket, which was the predicate for um, a search and which they found drugs and then an arrest and so on. And when he challenged this, um, the Supreme Court said, yeah, that was an illegal search. It's true. Uh, it, you know, there was not reasonable suspicion. The search wasn't justified. But, you know, this isn't the kind of case where we want to invoke the exclusionary rule because the exclusionary rule, you know, this is kind of trivial. And, you know, it, it, it really doesn't add up to something that ought to be excluded. I mean, Justice Sotomayor just went nuts over that. Right you know, in, in the context of, you know, stop and frisk and everything and, and had statistics that something like, you know, 40% of the American public has an unpaid parking ticket somewhere lurking in their past and does that mean, and so on, I won't belabor the point, but, but just to show that all these years later, yeah. yeah, there's something on the books called the exclusionary rule, but, you know, try to invoke it. Yeah, so, yeah, really a lot, a lot of these major Warren Court rulings, as you say, get, get hollowed out, they get curtailed, exceptions here, exceptions there, and suddenly this sort of radical uh, transformation of the Warren Court isn't, isn't looking quite so radical. Right. Um, but what about Roe? I mean, doesn't Roe signal that the Burger Court is, at least in some ways, kind of moving with what were liberalizing times uh, and, and couldn't, couldn't totally put the brakes on the social forces of sexual revolution, rights to privacy that were, um, you know, accelerating through the 60s and into the 70s. So I could talk about Roe against Wade till the cows come home, so you're going to have to stop right. me. Okay. Right, okay. I'll, I'll but, watch for the cows. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, what's fascinating about Roe is what we think of Roe against Wade, the symbol, was not how the justices of the Burger Court saw Roe against Wade, the actual case. So at the time that Roe reached the court, which was around 1971, uh, there, the professional elites of the country, the peers of the justices, the legal elites, the medical elites, and a substantial majority of the American public was persuaded that the 19th century you know, Comstock laws, the, the regime of uh, criminalized abortion, was no longer good public policy. Uh, the American Law Institute and so on. So what the justices were doing was really reflecting a widespread public opinion and what people are always surprised when I give this data. So there was a, there was a, a Gallup poll uh, taken in the summer of 1972 as the court was closing in on 
the final opinion that asks people, uh, do you believe that abortion should be a, que a question left to a woman and her doctor? And a strong majority of the public in all demographic sectors, including Catholics and prominently including Republicans by about two thirds, yeah. said yes, uh, women and doctors stayed out of it. Um, so the court really didn't think it was doing anything particularly, quote, liberal or radical, certainly. Um, and it wasn't perceived that way. So it took about a decade for the politics of abortion to flip, uh, for party realignment to be uh, maneuvered and fomented by some very smart people, Pat Buchanan, Kevin Phillips, people like this, names you might recognize. Just two examples to prove the point. So the first justice named to the court after Roe was John Paul Stevens, named to replace William Douglas, certainly a liberal justice, named by Gerald Ford in December of 1975, so almost three years after Roe. He did not get a single question in his Senate confirmation hearing about Roe against Wade, which tells us that it wasn't a political issue. And the first uh, presidential election cycle after Roe was 1976. The Republican national platform remained a big tent on abortion. Why? Because most Republicans thought abortion reform was a good idea and had no problem with Roe against Wade. By 1980, with the rise of the moral majority and the kind of um, uh, link that had been made uh, largely in response to the ERA, to the Equal Rights Amendment, Phyllis Schlafly, who recently died, and we talk about her in the book. She was a brilliant strategist who sort of made the the connection, the, the fear connection between the ERA and abortion and family dissolution and so on. Uh, all that stuff was happening along with the rise of Ronald Reagan uh, at, at the end of the decade of the 70s, but it, it took a good long time. Yeah, and, and the politics changed in those years too. People forget Jimmy Carter got a lot of evangelical Christian support, while Gerald Ford, you know, who had this liberal wife who was, you know, open about you know, birth control and, you know, alcoholism and so on, you know, sort of was, was distrusted. And that really only flips kind of after the Carter presidency and then they come to Reagan. So it, it becomes the political football with Reagan. Yeah, I mean, it's just fascinating. I mean, I was very interested to, I mean, it was a learning experience for, mm -hmm. for me to reconstruct some of this stuff, which I actually had done in an earlier book uh, that I did with, with my colleague Reva Siegel. But, you know, I mean, I'm just taking a guess that most of us in this room were old enough to have lived through that period. But it just, you know, we just forget because the, what happened next was so, you know, dominant and has, has dominated our political discourse for the last decades that um, it's just hard to put ourselves back in a time when uh, it was not exactly a shrug. But, you know, you mentioned the evangelicals. So the opposition to abortion around the time of Roe was purely and simply a Roman Catholic right. issue. The evangelicals, so as, as the abortion reform movement was gaining strength, uh, every religious denomination felt the need to take some kind of position about abortion. What's fascinating is that uh, the only categorical opposition came from the Catholic Church. The evangelical community, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, the National Association of Evangelicals, you know, they were not, you know, rah, rah, you know, abortion for everybody, but they, they adopted the kind of a moderate reform model along the lines of the American Law Institute model, that, you know, there can be a need, there can be a reason, and, you know, we're okay with that. That can be a, a moral choice, right? Uh, but, you know, that flipped too, and yeah. people forget. But um, in the earlier book, the, um, which is called Before Roe Against Wade, which, by the way, is available as a free download on the on the Yale Law School Library website because it's a bunch of primary source documents and we want it out there as teaching material so you can find it. Uh, we have the actual statements from the evangelicals and so on and it's just, you know, it's revelatory uh, how, how different it was from what we assume it, it would have been. Right, and then meanwhile all these Catholic Democrats move the other way. You know, Ted Kennedy was, you know, in today's language, pro-life and Joe Biden. I mean, any number of uh, Democrats were, and then the, just the political pressures and 
climate leads them to become pro-choice. So it's this, it's this very interesting yeah. kind of realignment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thinking about how different those times were in that history, another thing that struck me in looking where different justices come down on different issues is how it's much harder, um, or correct me if I'm wrong, to find in the Burger Court a liberal wing and a conservative wing. I mean, there are certain justices, but you know, today we're so used to thinking in these terms for many years now, and you know, Rehnquist dies, but he's replaced with a conservative, and it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty much clear who's on which team, with you know, obviously uh, some in the in the middle as well. Um, occasional exceptions over certain civil liberties issues where some of the conservative justices uh, join in, but here, it's very, it was very hard for me to see kind of clear patterns, clear blocks. Um, is there a way you would like, kind of give us an overview of the Burger Court and sort of what did it look like? And when people were going before it to argue, you know, which justices did they worry about getting the votes of? How, how, what was the landscape of the court? Yeah, well, I mean, you're, you're totally right. It really... You know, we assume today, or my students at, you know, at Yale have grown up knowing nothing but a court that was four on this side and four on this side, and the Constitution is whatever side Justice Kennedy got up on that morning. And <laughs> that's not historically the way the court has been, and it's not the way the Burger Court was. So there were three or four justices who you might say were kind of in the middle. I mean, on the, on the right was Berger himself and Rehnquist, and on the left were Justice Brennan, Justice Marshall, uh, and in the middle were you know Powell, Stewart, White, Stevens, the earlier John Paul Stevens. Um, maybe I'm leaving anybody out. I'm, yeah, Black but, in the early years was well, very they, liberal on certain yeah, things. Well, Black was just there for like a year, but right. um, but you know once once Nixon got his got his four, uh, so you know if you were arguing. Um, you know, a criminal law case, you were not going to get Byron White, who dissented in Miranda and mm. never never gave that up. But if you were arguing a case about racial equality, you, you were arguing it, and you were on the side of racial equality, you were arguing to Byron White, right. who in the Kennedy administration had worked in the Justice Department and was very, you know, was an enforcer of civil rights uh, and, and never gave that up. So, uh, you know, if you were arguing from, for, for, you know, corporate America, you certainly wanted Lewis Powell, right, uh, who kind of wrote the book on, um, you know, what we think of now. Everybody talks about, you know, the Roberts Court as a pro-business court and so on. I mean, that, I mean, Lewis Powell was corporate America's best friend. On the other hand, he was one of the strongest uh, supporters of Justice Blackmun on abortion and never gave that up. So. Uh, you know, you're totally right. Very few of these individuals were in, you know, one particular box, and that's what makes it a really interesting period and also kind of a confusing period when you look at it from the perspective that we're used to using when we look at the Supreme Court. Yeah, and another, um, I, I don't know if this came completely as a surprise at the time, but I think it did somewhat, and I sort of have to bring up, I've written a book on Nixon myself, and the United States versus Nixon, the tapes case, which is unanimous eight to nothing because Rehnquist uh, is recuses himself, having worked for Nixon. Um, but eight to nothing against the sitting president to, uh, that he has to surrender these tapes, which of course ultimately lead to uh, his implication in the crimes of Watergate and the cover up and, um, and in his resignation. And it, it was striking to me that this was an eight to nothing. Um, that it seems that today, you know, that liberals versus conservatives would rear its head and there would be those who would be loyal to the president or that party and, and those opposed, and it would be perhaps harder to get that kind of uh, unanimity. Um, but I, I'd love for you to talk about the case a little bit. You also have some criticisms or critiques of the sort of merits of the argument on executive privilege that I thought were interesting as well. Well, it's kind of ironic that, of course, this was the Nixon court that ruled against Nixon, but in 
forcing one president out of office actually uh, had an idea of executive privilege that really strengthened the presidency. So the president's gone, but the presidency is not weakened by what the court did to Nixon. Actually, you could say the presidency is strengthened, and what they did was push a, a, a law-breaking president out of office. Um, they perceived from the get-go that it had to be unanimous. Uh, Nixon, and you may know this better than I, um, truly assumed that his people would stand by him. And I gather the judgment of history is that had he gotten a couple of votes, uh, he would not have felt the pressure to resign. But once it was unanimous, he was shocked, and he d realized that he didn't have any choice. And uh, you know, I mean, the the brethren has a very good account of what was going on uh, behind the scenes there. And Berger, of course, assigned the opinion to himself um, to speak as the chief justice, and did not end up. Uh, making a very cogent job out of it. So the other justices kind of caucus behind his back and assigned themselves, you know, different parts of it and were sort of handing it to him to incorporate it to quote his opinion. And it, you know, ended up as a bit of a mishmash, but it it did the job and got Nixon out of their hair. Yeah, and then you describe, and I maybe had read this or elsewhere, but had forgotten it, that when Nixon you know, having said that with a definitive opinion from the court he would obey it, um, gets the opinion, he's reviewing it with his uh, lawyer, James St. Clair, and is kind of looking for to try to wiggle out of this yeah. commitment. And his lawyer won't let him. No. Uh, it basically says, I, I'm going to have to resign your counsel if you, yeah. if you don't kind of step up here. I mean, the irony of, you know, sort of that being the end of the game for Nixon, who had who had run against the court, had right. created this court. Um, it, it's just, it's pretty rich. You couldn't make it up. Yeah, his presidency is so bound up with the Supreme Court. Um, I mean, including the fights to appoint some of these people, um, you know, which are blocked by a Democratic Congress and in some ways have given us this legacy of contentious uh, nominations uh, today. Um, let, let me ask sort of one more question, and then I want to sort of open it up uh, because I'm sure all of you have uh, things to say. I think one other thing I alluded to earlier that I really liked about the book is besides taking us through the reasoning of the justices and how these decisions played out, you know, at the time in the 70s and 80s, you also then, in a number of the cases, sort of trace um, important follow on cases, uh, even into very recent times, to sort of see kind of how those legacies have lasted into today. Um, you know, I'll sort of throw it to you. Maybe pick one of these cases that sort of at the time was seen as um, certainly not minor, but um, that has where this Burger Court decision ended up having repercussions and sort of waves into today's jurisprudence that might might surprise us or might. Well, one that people wouldn't know the name of, uh, that has sort of defined our constitutional landscape, is the case of Washington against Davis. Does anybody know that case? Okay. So this was an employment discrimination case, 1976, I think. Um, it involved a, uh, a police exam, an exam to be uh, appointed to the police force of Washington, D.C., and um, white applicants passed the exam in a greater proportion than African-American applicants. So the question was, uh, was the exam discriminatory and so on. And the court, the case came in, it was one of many, many such cases uh, in those days. Uh, and uh, the court had, had recently started the practice of pooling the justices' law clerks. Uh, a new case would come in, there'd be a pool of clerks, and and they rotate around, a clerk would be, one clerk would be tasked for writing a memo that would be shared among the other clerks in the other chambers. Uh, so the uh, pool memo on Washington against Davis got assigned to a young law clerk in the chambers of uh, Warren Berger, whose name was Kenneth Starr. So, um, so Ken Starr looks at this case and, um, and he writes a memo saying, ah, oh, you know, this is like another one of these and uh, 
you know, it probably, you know, fits in with the cases we've been doing. And he doesn't make a recommendation. It just didn't ring any bells. The court grants it. And at the conference, the Justice's Conference, and by the way, I, I know, so you say, how does she know all this stuff? This is all in Justice's papers that are available to the world uh, at the Library of Congress and various places, and part of the fun of the book was reconstructing, using these manuscript collections to reconstruct this. Just, just to interrupt for a second, are all of the Burger Court Justices, well, I mean, Stevens obviously aren't, but... No. Mo, mo, or many no. collections? Uh, the best collections that are open Blackman, of course, is just a gold mine at the Library of Congress. Uh, Lewis Powell has a wonderful set of papers, which are in a very remote location, uh, Washington and Lee in Lexington, Virginia. But because Justice Powell really wanted his papers to be useful, they are mostly digitized on the website of Washington and Lee. Uh, all the memos and everything, it's a great set of papers. And the Potter Stewart papers uh, are at Yale, across the street from the law school in the Sterling Memorial Library. If, uh, White's papers are open. Berger's papers are closed for another 10 years okay. at William & Mary. Anyway, so Washington against Davis uh, goes to conference. And lo and behold, uh, uh, Stewart and Powell and White and Renclus say, you know, this is really a good chance to make some law here. And we're going to use this case as a vehicle to say that to make out a claim of unconstitutional discrimination you have to prove intent. You have to prove intentional discrimination, not something that just happens to have a disparate impact, which is the law under Title VII, statutory Civil Rights Act, but the Constitution itself, uh, you have to prove intent. So the case comes down holding that. What was seven to two? It wasn't, as, it wasn't seen as a big deal. Why wasn't it seen as a big deal? Because the question was, how do you prove intent? And the, the assumption was, you can prove intent if the foreseeable impact is just obvious, but you do it anyway, you can impute intent to that. So it was felt, okay, you know, if it's obvious that, you know, some people are going to flunk the exam or whatever, it wasn't seen as a landmark. What happened, however, two, two or three years later, a case came up to the court called um, Massachusetts against Feeney. So Massachusetts has, maybe they still have, I'm not sure, probably not, uh, an absolute veteran's preference for civil service. So any veteran that gets a passing score on the exam is parachuted over, or catap whatever the word is, catapulted over anybody else. So at that time, in the 1970s, three quarters of all men in Massachusetts were veterans. 1.8% of all women in Massachusetts were veterans. So women basically never got civil service jobs in Massachusetts. That was completely foreseeable that women would just not have public careers in the state of Massachusetts. So there was an equal protection lawsuit. And the court said, citing Washington against Davis, well, this wasn't the intent. You know, the intent was to honor veterans, not to disadvantage women. And so you lose. And, and so the, the requirement to show intentional discrimination coming from this Washington against Davis case is our law today. It's been invoked. Um, you know, to in, in death penalty cases where statistics are clear, the racially inflected use of the death penalty, you can't show intent. And, uh, you know, I could go on, but right, I won't. Right. But, I mean, I think that's yeah. a prime example of, um, of what matters today from what happened then. Yeah, small, small choices have, have long-lasting mm -hmm. uh, repercussions. Well, let's uh, turn it over to the audience. I want to... Uh, just ask that when you formulate your question, that it be one question, and that it be a question, uh, as opposed to a, a speech or a filibuster or uh, an extended comment. Um, so with that, um, yes, we'll bring the microphones over, so just wait as it, as we'll take a second to get to you. Thank you. So? Okay, thank you. I want to thank you for many things. This is not a speech. This is us to be thoughtful because I cover the Supreme Court um, and without you, who knows if there would have been a, a, a place for me. I know it would, I, the fight would have been much more difficult and I just wanted to thank you for all you've done with the court and what you're going to do in the future. I wanted to also go to the Burka Court, which seems to be influenced by so many outside events, such as the protests of the Vietnam War, the, the Civil Rights Movement, and other um, events 
that are taking place around the court. And my concern is when I look at cases that like Terry versus Ohio and in other cases and going forward on the race relations case, how much of this was part of the thought of Berger and growing up and reading about him, he seemed to come from a rather um, non exceptional <laughs> kind of background to become this person who's putting on these airs of such um, of majesty of some kind. And what was it, what pushed him into this conservatism? Was it some religious background? Was it the Times um, family? What, what caused him to be the person he was? Okay, so I mean, as I, as I mentioned, it's not really a book about Warren Berger, the person, but to try to answer your question, I mean, of course, the, he happened to be the Chief Justice, but he couldn't have done anything without four people agreeing with him, right? So uh, he wasn't really driving that train. It was really others on the court that were. He was, by today's standards, probably um, would not hold up the right wing of the Roberts Court, actually. I mean, he was an Eisenhower Republican. That's how he got to Washington. He uh, had an active role in the 1952 Republican National Convention. He got rewarded by getting a job in the Justice Department and getting on the Federal Appeals Court in Washington. And, you know, he was reflecting a sort of, I'd say, conservatism that was ordinary for the times in the spectrum. Um, it's like David, when we were talking earlier, had, had asked me about a line that, that Berger used oh, in, yeah. in a death penalty case, right? Yeah. Um, that that we'd be shocked to see any of today's conservative justices even thinking, let alone uttering about, you know, evolving notions of decency in the death penalty and so right, on. Right, yeah. He, here. here it is. Where Berger, it sounded like um, stuff you hear Stephen Breyer saying, um, that what constitutes cruel and unusual punishment is, quote, a moral judgment and its, quote, applicability must change as the basic mores of society change. You know, not what we associate with Scalia-style originalism. Yeah, I mean, because, quote, originalism, you know, was a made-up concept uh, of the Reagan years, and it, it was not part of conservative jurisprudence at all in, in, the, in the Berger years, and, um, and he didn't embrace it or reflect it. So it's a, you know, it's a nuanced kind of mixed package, actually. Um, not, uh, you know, not the sort of black and white like we like uh, then it's easier to see today right i mean you don't have people coming out of the federalist society there was no federal society they're not yeah. being groomed in this conservatism in the same way uh that you know so many roberts and scalia and so yeah. um, um uh, alito uh are are today um other questions yes sir in the back wait wait, wait for the mic you'll get the microphone yeah Without getting too political, assume you had a president who is going to pass an executive order banning an entire religion from immigrating to the United States. Um, how would that fly in the face of what the Burger Court has done? And where do you see the constitutional issues that can arise from that under the 14th Amendment? Thank you. By executive order, well, I mean, I would start there. I think, uh, you know, Congress has, well, we're, we, we were in the middle of this big flap over the Obama executive order over immigration, which remains unresolved because of the, the tie vote uh, in the court. But, um, but I cannot imagine the Burger Court or any court, um, uh, you know, upholding such a policy either as a matter of executive prerogative, administrative law, failure of notice and comment, that's the Texas case, um, or, you know, looking at uh, the plenary power of Congress to, to uh, control immigration uh, as the kind of default uh, status of immigration law. So that would, that would be quickly disposed of by any Supreme Court. Okay. Uh, yes, here in the second. Third row. 
Um, do, do we give too much credit to what I will call the right wing of the court by calling it a conservative philosophy? Because it doesn't seem to me that it really flows from what historical conservatism is and looks much more like a, an activist court responding to a religious and, and, and other ide political ideologies that are removed from what conservatism was. I don't know, you know, I mean, these are labels and certainly the, our notion of conservatism. I mean, as I said, you know, Warren Berger was a conservative justice, but in today's spectrum, maybe not so much. Um, so, you know, you make a perfectly good point, but I just think, I think uh, the, our understanding of these labels evolves in the context in which they're, in which they're used. Yeah, I mean, we, we can get into how historians use the term, and some will argue, well, we shouldn't speak of the history of conservatism, we should speak of the history of the right, because uh, it maybe doesn't carry that sort of paradoxical notion, can, you know, basically those who represent the right wing of the American political spectrum be activist, revolutionary, uh, uh, aggressive in either their jurisprudence or their view of the Constitution, because that's not conservative in the vernacular sense of that term. But I think, common parlance, we use conservative to, to refer to the right wing, and you know, so long as we're clear as what's a conservative temperament versus conservative politics, uh, we, can, we can avoid some, some confusion. I saw a hand over here, yes, front row. about a, a case involving uh, a man in Colorado, Peña Rodriguez, and... A, a, a case involving... Peña Rodriguez, a man in Colorado, who mm -hmm. is... Um, oh, yeah. A, apparently, the juror made a racist comment, and so there's a conflict between two principles that I think are both thought to be valid of impartiality, I an impartial trial, and secrecy of jury deliberations. And so I thought, with your perspective on the Supreme Court, what, what considerations do you think matter when resolving conflicting ideals that we both, you know, both of which we, we think matter. Okay, what he's referring to is a, is a pending case that's gonna be argued this fall before the court, uh, where, um, I, if I remember the facts right, a juror came forward and said, uh, by the way, there were some racist remarks from one of my fellow jurors in the jury room, and this should be used to impeach the verdict. And there's an old common law, um, uh, view position that um, you don't go behind you don't look behind the jury's verdict um, you know you've, you've got to you've got to stop somewhere and and it stops in the privacy of the jury room so that's the conflict and um, you know it's it's kind of a hot case I mean the the Obama administration the Justice Department has come in on the side of the state there say, saying saying uh, you know, if you if you get into the if you open the the closed blinds of the jury room um, in a situation like this, there's kind of it's a slippery slope, and there's no more privacy of the jury. So, um, so I don't know. I mean, I don't have a settled view of which side is right, but um, I'll just mention if you're interested in any Supreme Court case, uh, once the new term starts, first Monday in October, the court posts all the briefs on its website. So if people want to actually dig into any particular case, um, you can read the briefs and figure it out. It's, it's just, that's a tough, interesting case. So. You, you, you mentioned sort of the upcoming term, uh, and maybe others sort of haven't yet sort of gotten their uh, season preview. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are, there, are there other, you know, particularly um, important cases that you've, kind of glanced at that you think are going to potentially make big news come uh, next spring? Well, there's not a lot. Um, you know, it seemed to many people that the court was avoiding super hot cases during the period since Justice Scalia's death in, December, in uh, February. So the way the court calendar works is basically any case accepted from February on is going to be carried over into the new term for argument and decision. So 
things were really kind of slacking off. There's one pretty hot religion case uh, called Trinity Lutheran Church, uh, where it's a case from Missouri, where um, the state had this program of making available to schools uh, used tires, which they could put in a playground as a safer surface than you know asphalt, I guess, or whatever. Um, but it was not made available to church-related schools. So the question was, is that you know religious discrimination and so on and so on? Um, because unlike you know some other programs, public programs where uh, religion and non-religion are sort of on the same footing, the the line that the court has more or less maintained, more or less than more, but kind of formally has maintained is um, no public funds directly to a religious institution. So it's a balance of claims. And one claim is, you know, why, why should children who go to church schools not have the benefit of this better kind of, you know, old tires in the playground versus why should the government be channeling money directly to a religious institution? So that's a pretty hot case, and um, you know that's a case that it seems to me is not unlikely to be four to four. It's going to be argued in December. Oh, okay. So I d don't think we'll have a full court. Right. The way things are going by you know the first week in December when that case is going to be argued, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, in the back here. Uh, given the politicization of the court, do you think there's some uh, a sort of unintended positive benefits of having a, a court of eight justices, which sort of promotes um, more coalition building or compromises? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Shall I say more about that? <laughs> I mean, if we have a court at all, it's to decide. Um, you know, the important issues in the country as measured by, I mean, the metric that the court uses is a conflict in the lower courts over important questions of federal law. So, um, you know, in all these cases, a few cases that we've mentioned, they all have generated some kind of conflict and, um, and people want answers. So... Yeah, and, and, and to kind of make clear, which I think people probably recognize, this is, it's an eight-person court, but it's a pretty clearly divided four to four court too. So uh, it's not an eight court where these are eight people inclined to forge consensus yeah. all the time. And yeah. I mean, there the lines have been drawn for a while. And so that consensus probably in most of these cases is going to be fairly uh, elusive, I think. I mean, you know, most of what the court does does not call on that kind of polarization, right? So the court managed after Justice Scalia died to decide um, you know, many cases, and just in the normal course of things that were not, the court only had four, four to four ties out of 60 some odd cases that they decided in the last term. So it's not like they were just like totally stuck, but um, I wrote the other day about the consequences of the court, as I read it, being stuck in the contraception mandate case. Now that produced an eight nothing little unanimous seemingly opinion because they didn't decide anything. They were able to to discharge the case without deciding anything. So, you know, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but it's not it, it's it's not desirable in my opinion. Okay, yes, there. Microphone's coming. To get back to your book. Uh, your influences has been by rumor, fairly significant. In fact, certain justices, when they come to Washington, are affected by what they call the greenhouse effect, <laughs> like David Souter, who, as you described. Um, but on the other hand, you as a life writer, you did a Lewis Powell book? No, Harry Blackman book. Harry Blackman book, which was very interesting. Now you do the burger. To what extent, or can you give us an example of how your study of those changed your mind along some judicial philosophy sense. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question. Um, I learned a lot. I mean, digging into history, even if I lived through it, you know, I found extremely 
informative. Um, well, maybe judicial philosophy is kind of uh, I mean, a I don't stumbling actually, block. I yeah. mean, it, it, are, are, are there ways in which either the research on, on this book or, or on Blackman has, has made you rethink certain assumptions you had about the court, the way our judicial system works, those, those kinds of questions, not, not your own personal uh, philosophy? Yeah, well, of course, I, mean, I covered the court for 30 years for the Times, and I was at the court every day. So, um, I mean, that was my job, was to watch it as closely as I could for a, a really long time. So, you know, I can't really separate. Right. I mean, and that was, I was, there's a constant learning curve. I mean, the reason why I was happy to do it for such a long time was you just learn something every day, right? I mean, subject matter or, you know, or I viewed, I mean, I read, I mean, it sounds kind of nutty, but I did it anyway. I read every paid cert petition that came to the court for 30 years. So that was, you know, tens of thousands of cases. Now, I didn't, like, you know, necessarily read every word, but I handled and looked at every single one because it was a way of understanding um, what was troubling the country. Because, I mean, Tocqueville said this, you know, a long time ago, and it's still true. Americans will take their problems into court. And eventually, it, those become Supreme Court, not necessarily cases, but at least petitions to the court. And by looking at them systematically over a very long period of time, um, you know, I felt I sort of had a handle on what's going on in the judicial system, and I greatly valued and appreciated the chance to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, in, in my field, in, in history, there's, and there was an op-ed in the Times about this recently, there's kind of this dichotomy between, you know, those who study old-fashioned history of presidents and the Supreme Court, legal, military, diplomatic, and those doing social and cultural history. But really studying the Supreme Court is studying social history. Totally it is. It's, there's, there's so much you see going on from all different pockets of the country, all kinds of uh, social issues, family <laughs> issues, religion, uh, that, that, you know, becomes national debate uh, through these channels. Yeah, I mean, I see it as, as, I see the court as in some kind of constant dialogue with the public as mediated through the political process and ultimately through, you know, the confirmation, let's assume, a, assume right. the confirmation process. Right, um, <laughs> that it resumes at some point. Right, so, um, you know, I don't see the court as kind of separate and apart. It, it's, right. it's part of us, it's part of our ongoing you know, lives as, as Americans. Yes. Um, I think Wait, here's the mic coming. But I'm curious, I'm, obviously you're not a lawyer, and um, I'm, I'm wondering if Why you, is that obvious? <laughs> well, because I've read about it. Okay. I, mean, I, I think we all know she's not a lawyer. And, you know, how has that impacted the way that you look at the court over the, it's a very big question, but um, over the course of, you know, if you had been a lawyer, do you think you would have approached the study of the Supreme Court very differently? And how would that have impacted? Are you aware of how maybe that would have impacted some of the things you're articulating right now? About uh, no, court? I mean, no. a number of members of the Supreme Court press corps are, you know, do have law degrees. Um, you know, some very, uh, John Biskupic, I mean, some names you might recognize um, do have law degrees. but. Uh, you know, I, what can I say? I mean, I did a lot of on-the-job uh, learning, so. Um, um, I'm sure I missed a lot in the early, my early time there. Um, I missed, um, I think I missed a major turn on habeas corpus because I didn't quite understand it and uh, didn't realize the significance of what was going on back those who were in the Burger Court years. Um, but you don't necessarily get exposed to that in law school anyway. So, um, so no, I don't, I don't think it makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, can second row? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hi, Linda. It's really nice to see you. And I just want to say that um, I am a lawyer, and I covered the Supreme Court with Linda. And Linda knows more about, and I learned more from Linda and her coverage of the Supreme Court than any of my law professors. But <laughs> my question, and it's very nice to see you, my question is this. It seems that there is less and less regard on the court for precedent than I mean, you know, you go to law school and you learn that precedent is critical and certainty and all of those things. And I wonder, and I, and I do remember reading the Burker Court opinions in law school and how they dramatically changed and how the, you know, the justices are smart so they can pretend like they're honoring precedent when they really aren't because they kind of twist, twist it and, you know, twist their opinions to, to, to make it work. And I just wonder what your view is about precedent and, um, if you think it really has eroded, and how, if at all, does that impact the way we sort of order our lives? So, I mean, as you kind of suggested, a smart judge can, you know, play with precedent any which way, and, and can distinguish, and can, you know, choose what to emphasize, and so on. So, you know, I don't think there's been a huge bunch of uh, flat out overturning precedents in, in this court, but they certainly, they, they certainly made their choices of what to cite to justify ways they'd like to come out. Um, I mean, my favorite example of this just comes to mind because there was a case out of the Fourth Circuit that just came down today that upholds um, a very sectarian legislative prayer in a county in North Carolina. So a few years ago, the Roberts Court had this case called Town of Greece, one of the worst Supreme Court opinions in modern times, in my opinion, that upholds a sectarian prayer practice in a town. And what do they invoke for that? Uh, they invoke an old Burger Court precedent, Marsh against Chambers, that upholds the use of a chaplain giving the daily invocation in the U.S. Congress. And Marsh was, I guess, Marsh was a state chaplain, but in other words, not, uh, not a situation where somebody who has business in the town, zoning or something, has to put up with this kind of face-to-face. -face. It's one thing you're sitting in the gallery and there's a chaplain. I mean, you know, it was a five to four decision and the majority in a very kind of smug way, said, oh, you know, we said it's okay in Congress, so it's okay in your town meeting, too. And, you know, they're not, they're not getting rid of precedent, but they're misusing precedent, in my opinion, and that was not the only time. It's almost like the invocation of precedent, especially in confirmation hearings, becomes a way that both the left, but especially the right, have tried to sort of reassure senators that they're not going to do anything too radical, so they, they preach fidelity to stare decisis and so on. Yeah. But then once on the bench, you know, all, all bets are off. I think we've got time for, uh, say, two more here. So I see one right here. Hi. I'm, I'm wondering on a very different note. I work in disability rights over here. I work in disability rights, and I'm wondering how you're seeing the Supreme Court shifting in disability law and enforcement of the ADA. And then also, do you see, Justice Kennedy has a grandson with a cochlear implant, and I'm wondering if you're seeing any, um, in that arena, if that's having any impact on him in, in how he's making decisions on disability rights. So I really don't like to presume to know, to, pr uh, to pretend to know something that I don't know. I have no idea what's in Anthony Kennedy's mind about disability rights. I know he recused himself from an IDEA case back about nine years ago that resulted in the case not being able to be decided. Um, it was one of these fee shifting cases. I'm sure you know that, those, those line of cases. So, you know, the American Disabilities Act is a very, fascinating statute in that it basically says, thou shalt not discriminate against people with disabilities, and left a whole lot to be filled in uh, by the court deliberately. And, you know, the court um, 
in the judgment of Congress got it wrong, was, was reading the, the statute too narrowly and kind of went back to Congress and there were amendments and, uh, you know, I don't think there's been anything lately, but uh, right after the act, right after the bill became law, there were, you know, a slew of, like, what's a disability? You know, is, a, is, is uh, nearsightedness in, a, in an airline pilot a disability? This kind of thing. Um, and it's just, it's a fascinating, it's a living example of the interaction between Congress and, and the court. Um, I'll just say one more thing about that. So, you, you know, kind of theoretically, um, when, the, when the court issues a decision of statutory interpretation, you know, Congress can fix it. So the court supposedly is kind of freer to kind of do what it wants, because if they know if they get it wrong, Congress will, but now, these days, when Congress doesn't do anything, it's really upended a very long, very powerful set of assumptions about uh, the judicial role in statutory interpretation. And the ADA may be one example of it, but I just don't know enough specifics of what's going on now with the ADA to say, to say more about it. OK, sir. In my lifetime, I had the impression that conservative, more conservative justices, uh, as they grew older, grew more tolerant and more liberal, and that that conversely did not happen with the more liberal justices. Does that tell us anything? Uh, first of all, is, do you think that's right? Uh, and secondly, uh, does that tell us anything about uh, the kinds of people who get appointed to the court or the, the way the court influences their, their development as, as judges? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, empirically you're correct. Uh, there's more, there are more justices who've become more liberal over time than the reverse, although the reverse is not unknown. Um, Byron White's an example of a, you know, Kennedy appointed justice who became more conservative over time. So there's been interesting studies on this. Of course, it's a very small N, you know, it's hard to super generalize, but um, if you look at Republican appointed justices since say the mid 20th century, um, and you look at those who've undergone what a political scientists would call ideological drift toward the left and those who haven't. So how do you distinguish between those two groups? And what it, comes, what it seems to come down to is that uh, justices who were not Washington insiders, who came from elsewhere in the country um, without previous, you know, having sort of paid their dues inside the beltway, are those who are most likely to drift left whereas those who are sort of insiders, uh, Justice Department, um, known entities inside to elite Washington um, are gonna stay true to, uh, you know, the, the, one that, the one that brung them to the dance. And if you look at people on the court today, so um, the former category would be, say, Justice Kennedy, the latter category, and it's, you know, is the Chief Justice and Justice Alito and uh, Clarence Thomas, who even though he's from Pinpoint, Georgia, was an inside Washington bureaucrat uh, for most of his career. Um, so, you know, all that makes sense, right? I mean, not only being a known quantity, but I think the experience of coming to Washington in midlife, um, I mean, Sandra O'Connor has talked, to, talked about this. It, it's a very, uh, you know, powerful kind of shaking up your own self-image experience to suddenly you're a Supreme Court justice and we never lived in Washington, you don't know anybody. Um, that's one thing that David Souter really hated about Washington, that he became sort of a toast of the town. He didn't want to be the toast of anything. He, he thought he came to do, you know, a job. Uh, so this is, you know, the psychology of it's really interesting. But I think, um, 
what our recent experience tells us is we're not going to be seeing a lot of drifting in the future because um, presidents of, and, and you know the, the politicians surrounding an administration have wised up to this and are going to be um, you know more careful about who they who they pick. <laughs>